All right, everyone, let's go ahead and get started again. One of the legal issues that the current pandemic has brought to the fore in the US and beyond has been the implications for immigration into and out of the US and a variety of other countries. And so we are very pleased to have the Dorsey immigration team here with us to talk about some of those issues that have been uh, brought to the forefront by our current circumstances. It's my pleasure to introduce Yeva Albin, Candelario Arredondo, Rebecca Bernhard, and Bob Weber to talk about some of these issues. Now, I will say that Rebecca and Yeva are, are old pros at the Dorsey Symposium, but we were very thrilled uh, as Dorsey to have Bob and Candelario uh, join us at the end of last year to expand the, the scope and, and power of our immigration team. But nonetheless, I thought it would be nice to do a little bit of hazing in advance of their first symposium presentation. So I called the <laughs> president and asked if he could just throw a monkey wrench into everything immigration related on the eve of our presentation. And he, he, he complied. So um, Bob and Rebecca and Yeva and Condelario, with that very helpful introduction, I'm sure, tell us a little bit about immigration. Thank you, Ryan. And yes, um, I really never paid attention to Twitter um, before uh, 2016. And now I have had, had to add this to my uh, reading list for um, important news updates. Why don't you go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, we are, um, uh, this slide gives you a very high level overview of kind of how we're gonna progress today. Um, just as an employment law, there are multiple agencies that are in play, like the EEOC, the NLRB, and the Department of Labor, and then even sub-agencies like the Wage and Hour Division and the OFCCP within the Department of Labor. Immigration is not um, an exception to that, and there are several agencies in play and then several sub-agencies in play. Um, we're going to go through these um, in our slides uh, and talk about sort of the implications for immigration practice with an emphasis on business immigration. Um, but the last two slides I wanted to tell you, which we are not going to go through, do serve as a bit of an overview primer on the interplay of all of these agencies, explaining which one does what. So um, we'll do our best to try to put that in context during our presentation, but know that there are two slides at the end that help put that um, in context as well. And so now let's go to the next slide, which Ryan specifically requested. Um, uh, late Monday night and then continuing yesterday, we had a variety of headlines which um, obviously caused um, a huge ripple um, uh, in our practice and um, in uh, our clients um, are very, very concerned. Uh, at least as of two hours ago, there was not an actual executive order for us to be able to tell you legally what all of these headlines mean. But um, we are staying on top of this and we have folks in our group who are not on this webinar <laughs> who are also staying on top of this so that we can actually advise you what the real legal situation is. But Bob, why don't you help us understand sort of what's happened since the Monday night tweet through some of the press conferences and what we think that the executive order is gonna say. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. So um, we don't know, obviously, the details of the executive order and the details will matter. I think what we're telling clients right now is everyone should just proceed on processes that they had started and cases that are pending are still pending. Um, there, the US consulates are already closed, so people can't get visas, so that would not be something new. Um, the ability to travel in and out of the US is already very limited, and um, the, uh, the president has sort of limited authority to, to keep you from filing something where he does have authority is at the consulates and on the processing of cases. And it is possible that there is going to be some kind of 60 day delay in processing I-485 applications, which are the final stage green card applications. But I think the bottom line is that right now we don't know the details and we don't want people to be paralyzed by um, possibilities of what's going to happen. And we do recognize that, like many things that the president has done in immigration, there will likely be litigation, and that litigation may stay the effects of the action. 
So I think the main uh, takeaway that we've been telling clients is that, look, if you're in the middle of uh, preparing and filing something, uh, you know, just keep going forward. Uh, if something's pending, uh, will it take longer? Maybe. Uh, and uh, if you're stuck outside the U.S., which does include a lot of people, you're probably you know, still stuck outside the U.S., although we'll look for exceptions, uh, including possible exceptions for physicians and other uh, people in healthcare and agricultural workers. Thanks, Bob. Uh, next slide, Brian. Thank you. Um, I just want to remind everybody, I think this has already been up there in a couple other presentations, but this is where we are updating um, uh, our resources, not just in our area, but um, in labor employment generally, and then all across our firm with um, other specialties. So please do check this. We try to get um, an alert out every day that says what's new on this site, but just go to it, bookmark it, please, because when we do have actual things like law to tell you, we're going to tell you that here, um, and we'll try to keep this clutter free of just news. Um, so I want to turn it over to um, our partner, Yeva, um, because she's going to go into a little more detail about what Bob already hinted at in terms of the state of the state, um, and we'll start with the Department of State. Uh, Yeva. Thank you, Rebecca. As Rebecca mentioned, I will discuss updates relating to the U.S. Department of State, and then I will also discuss the U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Uh, U.S. Department of State operates U.S. embassies and consulates around the world, which control the issuance of visa stamps to foreign nationals. So if you have a foreign national employee who is currently outside of the U.S. and that employee needs to apply for a visa stamp in the passport, uh, the Department of State is the government agency that you need to deal with next. As Bob mentioned, the most significant development when it comes to the Department of State is that it temporarily suspended routine visa services at all U.S. embassies and consulates and canceled all routine immigrant and non-immigrant visa appointments. Uh, I should note that emergency visa services are still available to the extent it is possible um, to provide such services. So in the event of a true emergency, applicants need to contact a visa issuing embassy or consulate uh, and follow application procedures, which vary post by post. Uh, based on the reports we're hearing, emergency appointments are reserved for true emergencies. Um, although we're hearing that individuals um, who, in, who can request emergency appointments um, include medical professionals seeking to work in the US based on an approved H-1B or pursuant to the J-1 exchange uh, visitor visa, uh, particularly those working to treat or mitigate the effects of COVID-19. Uh, exceptions also may apply to certain agricultural workers. As the consulate remain closed, we will likely see and continue to see a significant backlog of visa applicants once they reopen. And to date, we have not received any guidance from the Department of State as to how that backlog will be handled. Um, interestingly, in the past, State Department had a policy of accepting domestic visa reissuance applications, but that policy stopped back in 2004. Uh, renewing this policy of domestic visa reissuance would alleviate a lot of difficulties created by consulate closures. Uh, so the American Immigration Lawyers Association, AILA, reached out to the Department of State yesterday um, inquiring about renewing this policy, but we have yet to receive a response. So yeah, for now... Let me, let, me, let me ask you a question just about that. So if I have an approved H-1B and I'm um, over in, um, I don't know, let's call it uh, the UK, why do I even need a visa? So uh, an approval of a H-1B petition, uh, Form I-129 petition, um, is not the end of the process when it comes to foreign nationals ability to travel and work in the United States. Uh, if the foreign national is currently lawfully in the United States in H-1B status and is not anticipating to travel internationally, that foreign national is okay. Uh, but if international travel is involved or this is a first time applicant um, for H-1B visa, uh, you need a visa stamp in your passport in order to be admitted to the U.S. in H-1B status. Thank you. Um, so what I was just going to say is that visa 
the applicants um, who, who need visa stamps should monitor the consulate visa appointment services website and monitor the interview appointment calendar regularly um, because it is unclear when new appointments may become available. Um, and, and appointment availability is varying from location to location. So um, applicants need to keep a close eye on that. Uh, I should also mention that as part of the consulate closure, services are still available to US citizens. Uh, however, the Department of State has significantly reduced US personnel at consular posts, so services may be limited. Um, of course, back in March, the Department of State issued a level four do not travel advisory, recommending that United States citizens avoid any global travel. Uh, and this is the highest travel advisory the federal agency can issue. But if um, you still have US citizen uh, employees currently abroad um, and, and they need services, they, they can still uh, seek assistance from, from consulates and embassies despite temporary closure. Uh, moving on to the next slide, please. Uh, another State Department related development um, uh, pertains to the National Visa Center. NVC is a branch of the Department of State that conducts pre-processing of all immigrant visa applications that require consular action. Uh, due to global COVID-19 outbreak, uh, NVC is currently working with reduced staff as well, which has affected its ability to respond to inquiries. Uh, most inquiries to NVC is currently made via the so-called Ask NVC feature on the agency's website, and at this time it is no longer available except for true urgent humanitarian or medical inquiries. So that summarizes major updates relating to the Department of State. Um, next, um, I would like to discuss the developments relating to the U.S. Customs and Border Protection Agency. Um, CBP. Uh, this agency manages and controls the entry of people to the United States, including both U.S. citizens and foreign nationals. So if you are a U.S. citizen or foreign national employee plans to enter the U.S., um, CBP officers is who they encounter at the port of entry. When it comes to international travel, as Ryan mentioned and as Rebecca mentioned too, many countries around the world, including the United States, have imposed travel restrictions to help curb the spread of COVID-19. To date, um, as of this morning, the Trump administration has temporarily suspended the entry into the United States of most individuals other than US citizens and lawful permanent residents who were physically present in mainland China, Iran, Ireland, the United Kingdom, or the European countries in the Schengen area in the 14 days preceding their attempted entry. Again, these travel restrictions do not apply to US citizens or lawful permanent residents, but all American citizens and legal permanent residents who have been in these high risk areas and return to the United States are required to fly to one of the designated airports where the Department of Homeland Security has established enhanced entry screening uh, capabilities. They must also self quarantine for 14 days after their arrival. Uh, it is not unlikely that uh, there's going to be additional countries added to this list. And, and Yeva, let me ask um, what Bob just talked about with regard to the president's announcement. Uh, so that announcement sort of strange, given that these bans already existed for certain hotspots. Do we anticipate that the that that what uh, President Trump's talking about is beyond these existing um, limits? Again, we are not uh, certain at this point, um, as of the beginning of this webinar, what the true scope of this uh, new executive order is. Early on, when the president made his announcement on Monday, there were speculations that the executive order will um, in include additional um, travel restrictions, but we have yet to find out. I believe uh, President tweeted this morning that the order will be signed today. So um, later today, we will know the true scope of, of the new order. Great, thank you, Yeva. <laughs> Moving on to the next slide. Um, another major development is that 
United States, Canada, and Mexico uh, mutually agreed to temporarily impose restrictions on an essential travel at land's port of entry. And these temporary border closures, again, contain broad exceptions for US citizens and lawful permanent residents. Uh, the question is, what is um, essential travel? Uh, essential travel uh, includes travel for medical purposes, travel to attend educational institutions, travel to work, um, travel for emergency response and public health purposes, cross-border trade, um, and the like. The rules specify that essential travel does not include travel for tourism purposes, such as sightseeing, recreation, gambling, or attending cultural events. Uh, the restrictions were initially scheduled to remain in effect until April 20th, uh, but were recently extended for an additional 30-day period until May 21st. So temporary workers with otherwise valid visas um, or status should still be allowed to cross the border if necessary. Um, employers may want to provide such workers with a letter explaining the need for travel um, and if possible, how that travel relates to essential industries and supply chains. When and the mm -hmm. I was just going to say, it's interesting on this one because um, uh, we heard a lot of uh, talk from the uh, first two panels about essential workers or critical in infra uh, critical industries, um, but it sounds like the Canadian and Mexico um, non-essential travel is not necessarily tied to that, but if you're a temporary worker and your company is still open for business, you can come in irrespective of those um, governor orders. Is that is that how you understand it? Cor correct. Uh, so, and, and from what we're hearing, um, CBP officers uh, uh, at the ports of entry, you know, are fairly, you know, sort of uh, uh, liberal, if you will, in interpreting <laughs> what essential worker um, or essential travel includes. Um, I should note that when the border closure was first announced, it was uncertain whether CBP would continue to accept new TN and L1 visa petitions from Canadian travelers. Uh, but uh, as of now, it appears that many CBP posts on Canadian border are still adjudicating new TN and L1 applications. Um, but it is still a good idea to contact the particular post of entry prior to travel if possible. Do you know if that's the same for Mexico? Uh, that so again, it, it's it's advisable to contact the post uh, mm -hmm. of entry, you know, prior to travel. Canadian, I mentioned Canada in particular because Canadians, for example, when it comes to L1 petitions, can submit new L1 petitions at the port of entry, mm -hmm. and that is not that is not the case when it comes to um, Mexican citizens. Um, also, TNs uh, for Canadian citizens can be presented directly um, at the port of entry without obtaining a TN visa stamp. Thank you. Next development that I, I want to cover is the satisfactory departure a relief measure. So for individuals in the U.S. who are admitted under the visa waiver program who are unable to depart before the current period of admission expires because of COVID-19, now there is an option to request relief in the form of satisfactory departure request. Um, both U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, USCIS, and CBP have authority to handle these requests, which essentially, if approved, grant an individual a period of 30 days in which to depart the United States without being considered to have overstayed. And just last week, it was announced that the visa waiver program travelers um, are, are able you know, where they meet the requirements uh, to get an additional 30-day extension of the admission period if they remain unable to depart the U.S. because of COVID-19. Finally, I want to uh, briefly mention the Trusted Traveler Program. Um, the U.S. CBP temporarily suspended operations at Trusted Traveler Program enrollment centers, and these programs provide modified screening for pre-approved members. Um, this temporary closure includes all public access global entry enrollment centers, such as Nexus enrollment centers, Sentry, FAST, and the like. Um, so these, these um, 
enrollment centers are paused until further notice. Okay, so um, thank you so much, Eva. Um, Bob, I know that this sort of inter inter interplays with what you're about to talk about. And I think when we were preparing, you had some comments about some of the trusted traveler and some of the um, maybe practical tips that folks can do. So I don't know if you wanna add that here, or if you wanna just jump right in and start with your overview of, um, of this. Um, well, yeah, I think, uh... I think that the trusted traveler program, I mean, it's important to know what, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, employees of our clients, obviously, who aren't on visas, who utilize these programs, and they should be watching um, for possible changes in these programs in the coming uh, days and weeks. Um, there was, I mean, uh, it feels like a million years ago, a development uh, in one of the programs where the Trump administration was uh, trying to punish New York related to, I think, sanctuary cities and uh, not making global entry available. That just seems like uh, forever ago. But, um, but I think in general, these trusted traveler programs are ones that may be subject to new uh, processes in the future. In terms of the next slide and some of the uh, closures of USCIS offices, I think actually Candelario is going to provide some detail about that because Great. that has been, um, uh, you know, he's been front and center in trying to manage uh, those details and some of the procedural changes that have occurred. Excellent. Thank you, Candelario. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. Um, as Bob stated, I will be providing a, an overview of the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, USCIS, the, agent, the agency charged with the adjudication of applications and petitions, and also part of the Department of Homeland Security. So USCIS closed international offices because of the COVID-19 crisis, but it should be noted that plans to close all its international office this year had been in the works prior to this crisis. Uh, additionally, since March 18, USCIS uh, closed its field offices and application uh, support centers to in-person services. The uh, field offices and centers will be closed through May 3rd. Uh, as a result of the closures, cancellation uh, notices were sent to applicants with previously scheduled interview appointments or naturalization ceremonies and will be automatically rescheduled, including um, appointments at the uh, support, uh, application support centers. USCIS, however, is still providing limited emergency services at its field offices, uh, and the assistance with emergency services is being coordinated through the USCIS contact center. For our office, applications to adjust status to legal permanent residence, uh, a green card, we began uh, receiving requests for evidence asking for items that we would normally submit at the interview. Uh, we had heard uh, that these applications were being approved without the required interview. And as of this week, we had several clients get their applications approved with the, without the interview. Uh, next slide, please. So just a quick interruption there, that's significant because since the Trump administration started or very early on, they've required all employment-based uh, adjustment of status applicants to be interviewed before getting their green card. And so we have a couple instances, uh, well, more than a couple now, where there was no interview, the interview was canceled, and then the case was approved uh, without an interview, which was the pre-Trump normal. Now, all of this is before the tweet, so uh, there was just a short window of uh, approvals before interviews, and we're not really sure what's going to happen after that, but um, I think it is uh, a notable development. Thank you, Bob. Um, USCIS also suspended premium processing for all I-129 and I-140 petitions. Um, the form I-129 is the form for, is the petition for non-immigrant workers, except for example, for H-1B and L-1 uh, visa petitions. The Form I-140 is the immigrant petition for alien workers. It's the step before the adjustment of status. 
it may be possible uh, to request expedited processing on certain cases, uh, as, as we have heard, uh, specifically in areas of, you know, where medical professionals are involved. However, it should be noted that guidance prior to the COVID-19 crisis makes it likely that H-1B cap cases will not be eligible for premium processing if and when USCIS lifts the uh, suspension. Next slide, please. USCIS has also provided some flexibility on requests for evidence and notices of intent to deny responses received within 60 calendar days after the due date will be considered before taking any action on this case. This uh, applies to requests and notices primarily extended in May up to May 1st, March to May 1st. Our office has continued to respond to requests and notices prior to the due date, but it is, it's been good to know that there is some flexibility available. USCIS has also rela relaxed the original wet signature requirement, but the original document should be retained in case UI USCIS requests them later. Our office has continued to file applications and petitions with the use of scanned copies of the signed forms without issue. Yeah, Candelaria, let me do a quick interruption there. So just to uh, reiterate, even though USCIS is giving us flexibility on the due dates, we're trying not to utilize that flexibility. I think, uh, you know, if we can get the things filed when they're due, we're just staying out of trouble that way. But the flexibility on the signatures, particularly because so many of our clients are working from home, that is something we're utilizing and is very uh, useful. And we have, you know, obviously we can send documents sort of just as attachments, but we're also using DocuSign and that is working. Those cases are being receded. And just quickly about our own staffing, because uh, as, as people who work in immigration probably know, there's a lot of hard copies and filings need to be made via hard copy. And we do have uh, people physically in our Minneapolis office. Uh, we're working closely with uh, uh, the, a group, uh, sort of the copy center at Dorsey, and we've kind of developed this whole system for that. But I'm in the office every uh, day. Candelario's in the office every day. Uh, Rebecca's in the office every other day. Yeva's in Seattle, and the Seattle team is uh, work from home, but they're very efficient with that, and they also have someone in their document services in Seattle. Uh, so we've been able to adjust uh, and continue operating. And so we get mail every day and we send out uh, hard copy approval notices regularly uh, because we know these things are important for uh, clients uh, for various reasons. But I just wanted to make that distinction that in some instances when you get flexibility, maybe you don't want to execute or take advantage. But in the case of the uh, scan signatures, uh, that's a great development that, I mean, who Bob, knows? I have a question about that, if you don't mind me interrupting. Um, uh, I, I know that um, I'm going to talk about this a little later in our presentation with regard to the Form I-9, but um, are we still advising folks to actually eventually get a wet signature for that hard copy that we're keeping in the file, or do we feel like using the DocuSign is sufficient for later when we retain the original documents? Um, uh, well, that's a great question. I think that if you, add, I mean, the guidance would suggest that you should have the hard copies. Um, we haven't totally sorted out. Uh, you know, my suspicion is that they're, you know, if they, if there's some, if they think something was fraudulent, they're going to do an audit. Um, but I, I think on the I-9, which is going to be very different, mm -hmm. where they're going to want um, you to go back uh, because, and especially, I think the environment for, for audits on I-9s, I think the president's tweet is signaling what he has in mind, but yes. I'll let you get to that one. But I, yep. you know, so it, I think it's less of a, of a, of a issue than in the I-9 context. Thank you. Yeah, next slide, please. Something related uh, to the cancellation of this 
application support center appointments is that USCIS is reusing previously captured um, biometrics for employment authorization applications. Uh, this applies to previously scheduled biometrics appointments or applications filed on or after March 18, while the application support centers remain closed. Our office has been uh, filing many of these employment authorization extension applications, and we recently received an approval within two months of filing. This was a, for a case that had previously uh, had uh, its uh, biometrics appointment uh, canceled. Um, I think that the, um, that the process for reusing the biometrics is for those cases that have already had biometrics captured. If the applicant has not had their biometrics captured before, I think this is where the um, automatic rescheduling of the appointment would happen at a later time. Next slide, please. Applications for adjustment of status and petitions for extension of stay or change of status as of February 24th have had to address the public charge rule. During the COVID-19 crisis, questions of what is a public benefit come, have come up. Um, some of the common uh, responses to questions are any testing, treatment, or preventive care related to COVID-19 will not be considered as part of the public charge determination. Another one is unemployment insurance will also not be considered public, a public benefit under the public charge determination by USCIS. The form I-129 contains a list of these public benefits applicable to non-immigrants, and we would recommend that people familiarize themselves with it. We, um, we also want to make sure that people understand uh, the, the, the benefits as they prepare for this petition uh, applications, as well as for the adjustment of status. And, and as I understand it, Condolera, you've developed a nice checklist that you have been walking clients through when we've had to fill out these forms, correct? Yes, uh, so, we, so we have a, just a quick uh, checklist for the Form I-129, but we also have a, a questionnaire that we send to clients that are filing the I-485, the Adjustment of Status application, and we, and, and we obtain that information from them prior to um, completing the actual form. So I believe this is the section that you were going to discuss the H H-1B workers and unemployment. Yes, uh, yes. Your your sub your your segue to me is great, Candelario, because a lot of folks um, uh, are concerned about the ambiguity around what constitutes a um, public charge, and um, and in particular, there is a lot of debate within the immigration community about H-1B workers and unemployment insurance benefits. So, first and foremost, generally speaking, unemployment benefits are not a public benefit that would count as um, going against you in your public charge application. But we need to talk about H-1B workers in particular because um, I think a lot of folks think that H-1B workers might be eligible for unemployment benefits. And it's even possible that when they apply, they will be granted them. As Ryan noted in, the, in um, several of the uh, panels and many of the other panelists noted when discussing the uh, CARES Act um, bump to unemployment insurance benefits. And I think Marilyn went into some really great detail on the eligibility issues uh, in general in her panel. Um, there are generally two parts to eligibility and these are controlled by the states. So all 50 states have unfortunately different rules, although they are basically in kind of some major buckets and they're in some similar buckets because the federal system um, requires states to abide by certain basic rules in order to be reimbursed. And that's especially true now in the care Act um, stimulus payments that are bumping up the, um, the unemployment benefits, including that $600 um, extra benefit. Um, but as I think President Trump's tweet signals, um, uh, states better abide by these 
because the federal government is going to not reimburse states and they will audit these. And the federal government, Trump's philosophy is such that foreign workers should not be displacing US workers and they certainly shouldn't be displacing them with regard to benefits that are for uh, American workers. So let me just briefly say that the two parts of the eligibility are that the employer part is that there's a loss of employment through no fault of the employee. And that's sort of the employer part. So that's where folks in the other panels were talking about, does a furlough meet the need? Does some other kind of layoff meet that need? That's usually the part of um, unemployment that we get involved in because the employer is often uh, concerned about someone who commits misconduct. So generally in this, in this arena, as other folks have already said, chances are that the layoffs and furloughs that are happening are gonna meet that employer test. But there is an individual component. It's usually based on the prior work history of that individual. And it's also um, based on the individual's ability to be available for work. Now the CARES Act stimulus has said that certain reasons that you're not available, if they're related to COVID-19, will not disqualify you. But an H-1B worker is um, only available to work for the specific employer that has sponsored the H-1B. So in most states, that H-1B worker would not be eligible because they would not meet the available for work test. I actually had a client long before the um, current COVID-19 pandemic who was awarded um, unemployment benefits when she suffered a layoff. She was on H-1B status and she suffered a layoff when a particular business here in Minnesota went out of business and basically uh, terminated the employment of everybody. And in that rush, everybody that had that employer was just kind of rubber stamped to get their unemployment benefits. However, about three weeks later, she was contacted by the Minnesota Department um, of Economic and Employment Development and she was re forced to return those um, benefits. So I think it's important for people to realize, and I think they were already cautioned in the other panels, that you, we, cannot, we cannot tell folks whether they are or are not eligible um, because that's gonna be defined differently by the states. And it is our general understanding that H-1B workers are traditionally interpreted as not being available for work under ordinary state rules. So um, as uh, the other folks have hinted, um, uh, the, uh, the various agencies have issued a lot of um, uh, flexibility with regard to electronic signatures, um, the alleviation of wet signatures, and the student um, employment situation is no different. Um, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement folks have also issued some guidance on the electronic issuance of the Form I-20, which is the form that goes to students. And so schools are um, able to um, basically email those forms forms to students. And if the student is a minor student, then it's going to be emailed to the parent. And they've, um, and they've also basically clarified that only the primary designated school official or the designated school official can sign those um, forms. If those folks are able to sign them physically, great, but if not, they can sign them electronically. Can you go to the next slide, please? So uh, the Form I-9, uh, most everybody, even if you're not aware of other immigration, you know that the Form I-9 is the employment eligibility verification document that all employers are required to complete. Uh, they are required to complete it um, within three days, although the rule actually says the employee must complete it on their first day. There's a three-day grace period. Um, but we've been given some relief during this current um, uh, pandemic that we'll talk about. Um, generally speaking, the form requires the employer to physically inspect the documents that the worker is presenting to show that they are authorized to work in the US. There are two components to the authorization that the employer is supposed to be physically inspecting, both the employee's identity and the documents um, uh, authorizing the employee to work. So that can happen, um, for those of you familiar with the form, can happen by presenting one document from list A because that serves as both an employment authorization and an identity verification, or it can be one document from both list B and list C. That's in normal terms, the driver's license and the social security card, but there are many, many other um, documents. We've had employers long struggle with, um, before the COVID-19 situation, long struggle with remote workers and how do I physically do this? Um, and I think that the, um, the department was, um, ICE was considering that anyway. And then during the COVID-19, they issued um, a relief from that physical presence requirement. Um, in normal term um, times, 
we would uh, counsel employers to get an agent, get somebody who they are um, authorizing to physically inspect those documents and then they would fill out that employer section saying that they uh, physically inspected that. But now, um, uh, uh, for at least uh, the foreseeable future, the Department of Homeland Security is going to exercise discretion and they're deferring the physical presence. Please be clear that that's a deferral. That is not a waiver. So if you are onboarding folks, you may get them to fill out the, they should still fill out the document within that first day of employment and uh, that three-day grace period and the employer must review the documents so they can now review them by scanning them. The employee can scan them and send them via email. But the employer is required to eventually review and 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 further certify that they were able to do this um, when the um, conditions change and, and we are able to do um, uh, um, uh, 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 a physical review. So this is a sort of deferral of the physical requirement and you are still required to fill out the form properly. And we are cautioning employers that eventually there will need to be a physical uh, presence inspection. We just don't know when that is. Another relief for those of uh, you who fill out your I-9 forms um, with regard to using the E-Verify program is that they have extended the time frame for taking action to um, resolve um, tentative confirmations. So there is a tentative non-confirmation report that you get when you are um, completing the E-Verify process and the, um, the behind the scenes um, uh, databases are not able to verify or confirm that the social security number matches. So you normally have to re resolve those within three days, but they are basically expanding the time uh, frame uh, to re review that uh, because of the um, public office closures, uh, as well as um, employers um, being um, closed because of this. So that's a little bit of relief. Um, you're, you, are, you do still need to resolve those eventually, but they are uh, extending the time frame. Next slide, please. Uh, there are some other physical postings, and these are a little bit consistent with some of the stuff that Drew talked about earlier with regard to the new um, paid benefits um, and that require postings. Uh, there's been a longstanding rule that um, employers must post the LCA, which is um, the form related to um, foreign labor certification with regard to the um, H-1B and the requirement that um, you have to pay a certain prevailing wage. Um, normally, you have to post that where the uh, foreign national will be working, um, as well as in other conspicuous places consistent with the Department of Labor's general posting rules. Um, they have issued some guidance that you can comply with that electronically. Um, we've even had um, some uh, folks advising folks to post it in the foreign nationals home if they are working from home. Um, so uh, we encourage you to, re to go to that link or call us, but generally speaking, uh, emailing um, notices and posting them on um, websites or posting them um, electronically um, on the places where you ordinarily post electronic notices, we believe will comply. Um, the Department of Labor is also um, the agency that uh, does the first level of the employment-based green card applications in the PERM situation. They're now issuing electronic approval materials um, for certified PERM applications. And so that's another, um, uh, uh, even though, as Bob said in his, um, in Candelera's portion, that so much of immigration is paper-based, the Department of Labor is now um, doing electronic approval. Um, and ordinarily, that used to be a paper approval, which required um, uh, 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 signing. Uh, we do want to um, uh, mention, especially in light of President Trump's tweet and um, in, uh, imminent executive order, that um, generally speaking, the PERM process requires a, a very complex set of recruitment um, requirements. And if you are um, in the midst of furloughs or actual um, more permanent layoffs, this is going to have an impact on the, um, your permanent, um, your PERM process and any PERM applications that are um, submitted. And so you're going to want to consult with um, uh, uh, with us, hopefully, or with your other council, um, to uh, make sure that you are aware of whether or not that's going to be a problem when seeking um, a DOL certification. Yeah, and let me just say something yes, about Bob. that. I do think that the PERM process is going to be a process subject to a lot of change for the rest of this year, and if Trump is reelected beyond, so during the Trump administration, the PERM process has been relatively untouched as compared to a lot of other things. And I think that was justified 
uh, even by sort of the more restrictionist uh, favoring people because the unemployment rate was so low. But clearly in the last month, uh, you know, millions of people have applied for unemployment and the general idea, which is pushed forward by a lot of sort of populist media and activist types is that, look, all these uh, US citizens are losing their jobs and how could we possibly uh, let uh, foreigners get green cards and uh, stay in the US when we have all these Americans who are unemployed. And so what I think is going to happen is the Department of Labor is going to become very slow in processing PERM applications and also conduct a lot of audits and possibly something called supervised recruitment. And so um, a lot of attention needs to be paid to the PERM process going forward and being very strategic about um, how to set up the requirements and comply uh, in anticipation of sort of a new normal there. Thanks, Bob. I, I have a question about that because as um, many folks who do um, avail themselves of this whole PERM process and in in seeking in, in, um, an employment-based green card for some of their employees, there's uh, there are several phases at the Department of Labor stage before you go into the USCIS stage. So, um, and you just talked about the sort of recruitment aspect of it, but there is this um, uh, uh, earlier kind of prevailing wage certification that happens as well. Um, are you recommending that we still go forward with that? And, and, and aren't there sort of timelines um, associated with that for how long that, that is good for? Yeah, well, all these things, uh, you know, are very case specific, but if you anticipate that you, you know, have employees who are on work visas, particularly H-1B visas or L-1 visas, and you plan to retain them, or you, you, you certainly expect to retain them, you do have to be sensitive to the limited amount of time available on their H-1B or L-1 visa and try to proceed even during uh, the challenging environment, given that the process takes a long time and obtaining prevailing wage. So for example, you, you could put together a job description and seek the prevailing wage and it may not come through and for four or five months and hopefully we're in something close to normal, well, better than now in four or five months. <laughs> New normal, I will yeah, call yeah. it. Yeah. So, yeah. so and, it and, is uh, case by case uh, looking at these things, but given how long the process is, uh, you want to be strategic uh, in, in thinking about this. Thanks. Um, next slide, please. Um, so why are we talking about the driver's licenses in the immigration section? Um, so uh, earlier, as um, Kandelaria and Yeva were commenting on um, uh, sort of some relief for folks who maybe can't travel and maybe can't get their visas renewed or, or having um, or maybe are stuck here in the U.S., there is also this issue of um, if, your, if your renewals of your existing valid statuses are delayed, it is often hard to get renewals of your ordinary state driver's licenses. And so I'm using Minnesota as an example because generally um, Minnesota has given an extension and this is for anybody who has a Minnesota driver's license or an ID card. Um, if they were gonna expire um, during this emergency, they're gonna be extended for two months after the month that the peacetime emergency ends. And that's important for foreign nationals who are here because they often can't get their driver's licenses renewed because until they um, have a valid extension on their current immigration status. And if that's being delayed, their license might expire. And so they're just in this sort of um, possible downward spiral of having um, a variety of um, statuses and licenses expired. Um, and at least here in Minnesota, and I suspect some other states, there is some relief um, with regard to um, the ability to get that renewed. And hopefully, as Bob just commented, when we get to the other side of this and um, things start moving through the queue again, uh, this, um, this temporary extension will help folks who were sort of stuck in in that um, um, in that zone. So I think we have a little less than a minute left. So let me show you the last two slides that I was talking about. Um, basically, the Department of Homeland Security has um, three agencies under uh, it. It has USCIS, which um, I, does the um, kind of principal application um, processing. There is CBP, which you have discussed, which is really the border folks. Um, and then there's ICE, which is the folks within um, the US and that's the sort of investigation and enforcement. Next slide. 
And then um, the Department of State um, also deals with um, uh, the um, U.S. embassies and the consulates, and so they're, they're, they're dealing with um, issues when you are outside the U.S. and seeking entry. And the Department of Labor has jurisdiction over, of course, U.S. labor laws, which means it oversees many of the non-immigrant um, employment-based um, applications, as well as the employment-based um, green card process. And this is actually interesting in light of um, what Bob said and, and, and the current administration's hostility towards um, foreign workers displacing U.S. workers, because this has always been true, that their job is to make sure that anybody who is seeking to employ foreign labor is complying with all the rules in place. And um, so that's um, our uh, uh, panel. Uh, thank you all for your attention, and thank you, Candelario, Yeva, and Bob, for uh, your excellent uh, comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mario, thank you very much. Always difficult to present and keep your other eye on your Twitter feed and you did a great job. <laughs> so we will take another break now until 1140 a.m. and we'll get started promptly at that point with our final session on tax and benefits challenges ahead. We'll see you all in a bit.